If you have a copy of God's Word, um, if you don't, you can find one in the pew rack in front of you. Uh, turn to 2 Kings 11. We'll look at verses 1 to 12. We are in a series on 2 Kings, and uh, it's um, some interesting stories here. And I wonder what your favorite kind of story is. Today we, want, we read about a story that the, lo- that the Bible loves to tell over and over again. So let me read the first, 11 verses, first 12 verses of chapter 11. When Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she proceeded to destroy the whole royal family. But Jehosheba, the daughter of King Jehoram and the sister of Ahaziah, took Joash, son of Ahaziah, and stole him away from among the royal princes who were about to be murdered. She put him in she put him and his nurse in a bedroom to hide him from Athaliah, so he was not killed. He remained hidden with his nurse at the temple of the Lord for six years while Athaliah ruled the land. In the seventh year, Jehoiada sent from the commanders of units of a hundred and the Karaites and the guards and had them brought to him at the temple of the Lord. He made a covenant with them and put them under oath at the temple of the Lord. Then he showed them the king's son. He commanded them, saying, This is what you are to do. You are in the three, you are in the three companies that are going on duty on the Sabbath and a third of you are guarding the royal palace, a third at the sir gate, and a third at the gate behind the guard who take turns guarding the temple. And you are in the other two companies that normally go off Sabbath duty are all to guard the temple for the king. Station yourselves around the king, each man with his weapon in his hand. Anyone who approaches your ranks must be put to death. Stay close to the king wherever he goes. The commanders of the units of a hundred did just as Jehoiada The priest ordered, each one took his men, those who were going on duty on the Sabbath and those who were going off duty, and came to Jehoiada the priest. Then he gave the commanders the spears and shields that had belonged to King David and that were in the temple of the Lord. The guards, each of which, of with his weapon in his hand, stationed themselves around the king near the altar in the temple from the south side to the north side of the temple. Jehoiada brought out the king's son and put the crown on him. He presented him with a copy of the covenant and proclaimed him king. They anointed him, and the people clapped their hands and shouted, Long live the king. Let's go to the Lord briefly in prayer. O Lord, these are your people. This is your word. I do pray that The words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts would be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O Lord. That we would be sanctified by your truth. Your word is truth. Amen. In the uh, sci-fi novel I just uh, finished, Alfie is a superhuman assassin that is hunting the Stillwater family because he believes the dad has stolen his family. It's a long story. Two members of the secret organization that pay Alfie to assassinate people are hunting Alfie since he's gone rogue. Longer story. These men's names are Cloaker and Oslet. The organization wants the two members to destroy Alfie and the Stillwater family when they catch them. Alfie hunts the Stillwater family across the country and has them trapped in a deserted church's bell tower. The father is wounded, the mother has no weapon to defend the family, and the two girls are helpless. And just as Alfie is about to strangle Mr. Stillwater to death, Cloaker and Daniels arrive and kill Alfie. But when they turn their attention to the Stillwater family, it seems that the Stillwater family has gotten out of the frying pan and into the fire. But as Oslet raises his gun to shoot Mr. Stillwater, Cloaker turns his gun on Daniels and kills him. Clocker, much, of the, much to the reader's surprise, saves the Stillwater family. These kinds of stories are not just in fiction. I have had such stories related to me personally. One of my professors from seminary, Jerem Bars, grew up in a home of communist and atheist, and he himself was an atheist when he went to college. 
He became very influenced by existentialist philosophy and art and it led him to believe that life was meaningless. One morning before dawn, he took a bus ride out of town where he was on a high cliff. He walked down the edge intending to throw himself off. But just as he was about to jump, the light of dawn broke on the horizon and he stepped back from the ledge startled by its beauty. Wondering if there was some beauty worth living for, he went back to college and shortly after that was introduced to the teachings of Francis Schaeffer, an evangelist who led him to Christ. His life was literally saved by the goodness of God's grace in creation and the gospel. These kinds of stories happen in church history too. In 1974, the church in Ethiopia consisted of 14 local congregations, 14 and only, only 5,000 members. Then came the communist takeover, known in Ethiopia as the Derg. I mean, Gistu Mariam, an, an army officer, participated prominently in the overthrow of the emperor, emerging through violence as preeminent m- military ruler by 1977. I mean, Gistu sought uh, aid from from the Soviets established a socialist republic and drove the church underground. All church properties were seized. Church leaders were imprisoned. Then politically and economically things did not go well for the people of Ethiopia. I'm sure many, many of you remember that. So Megistu abandoned socialism and was forced to flee to Zimbabwe in 1991. When they looked to find what had happened to the church, there were now 53 congregations instead of 15, and there were approximately 51,000 members instead of 5,000. Of course, we find these kinds of stories in the Bible. A man named Saul was on his way to arrest and kill Christians. This had become his whole raison d'etre to persecute the church. On his way, however, he was blinded by a light and Jesus appeared to him, forever transforming him into the Apostle Paul, writer of 13 books of the New Testament and church's greatest missionaries. We have a similar biblical account before us this morning in 2 Kings. What's going on here? The promised Messiah is to come through the line of David. But Athaliah, upon learning of the king of Judah's death, sets about killing the whole royal family so that she can be queen. The promised victory of God's king and kingdom are all but lost, or so it seems. But what Athaliah doesn't know is baby Joash, son of the king of Judah, has been scooped up and hidden away by his aunt until he's old enough to be brought forward and anointed the true king. Does this sound like a familiar story? It's because it is. The king of kings, Jesus, is born in Judea 900 years later. And what happens when Herod tries to kill all the newborn uh, boys in the area to preserve his kingship? You remember? In a vision, Joseph, in a dream, Joseph is warned and his And he and Joseph and Mary take and hide the boy away in Egypt until things cool off. Satan and his forces live to defeat God's people and his plan. They throw all their firepower at God's people and his plans, but the Lord delights, the Lord delights to snatch victory from the jaws of defeat. Just when we think the final nail has been driven into the coffin of God's plan, he delights to snatch victory from the jaws of defeat. Nowhere has he done this more ultimately than at the cross. The scene from The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe depict for me probably the best example of of what happens at the cross. Satan and his minions are making sport of Aslan. They are mocking him, deriding him, shaving him, shaming him. The white witch thrust her dagger in into Aslan with such confidence and such glee, she thinks that victory belongs to her. But what she doesn't know is what Lewis calls a deeper magic. 
What Satan and his forces don't know about is that God delights to snatch victory from the jaws of defeat. He loves to bring about deliverance when all hope seems lost. It's through the cross that Jesus saves sinners just like you and just like me. It's through the cross where victory is snatched from the jaws of defeat. It's exciting to watch victory be snatched from the jaws of defeat at a sporting event, in a movie, to read about in a novel. Yet, if we're honest, it is often hard for us to believe that God might do something like that in our own story. We're, we are impatient. We want to see the fireworks and the final score now. We want to fast forward to the final scene. We want to skip to the end of the novel. We don't want to wait the six years for Joash to grow up. We want to see deliverance now. But God so often doesn't work like that. He is so often in no hurry. He has a grand plan to unfold. He has people he wants to make part of this plan. Perhaps he wants to use an unsuspecting ant to hide away the rightful Davidic king. Perhaps he wants to use a carpenter named Joseph to protect the Messiah. Perhaps he wants to use us, if we'll be patient, to play a small part in his plan to snatch victory from the jaws of defeat. I was talking with someone in the last week, and he was sharing with me about Augustine's mother, Monica. She was... Married to an unbeliever and had three children, the youngest of which was a juvenile delinquent. And in, and in college, he converted to a different religion. She was frustrated with him and said some things she'd later regret. Her son went on to the city to live a worldly life. He had a mistress, yet Monica didn't give up on him. For 17 long years until her son, Augustine, heard the word of God coming from almost nowhere and gave his life to Christ, she prayed for him. A grand total of 40 years she prayed. And this Augustine became arguably the greatest theologian and philosopher that Western church has ever known. My own mother prayed for me patiently. And had other women in the church praying for me patiently while I was a prodigal son. I have a pastor's friend whose grandmother prayed for and loved her grandfather for almost 50 years until he finally gave his life to Christ at age 70. God's planning and timing is beyond our understanding, but this much we do know from this passage, God loves to snatch victory from the jaws of defeat. When his promises are brought to the brink of extinction, when his promises are brought to the brink of extinction, that's when God delights to display his redeeming power and plan. Perhaps that ministers to you this morning. Perhaps you feel like you are in the grip of defeat. Perhaps there is a sin in your life you can't shake. You have tried everything. You feel that there is no hope. The message for you this morning is don't give up. Hang on. The Lord loves to snatch victory from the jaws of defeat. Maybe you are... You or someone you love is battling health or mental health problems. Perhaps the situation seems beyond remedy. Don't give up. The Lord snatches victory from the jaws of defeat. I don't know what you might be facing. Financial or family issues that seem beyond hope. God's word tells us to hang on. There is hope. I cannot promise you that everything you face will be remedied soon. I cannot even tell you that you'll live to see the things you face fully redeemed. There's no health and wealth gospel here. But what I can tell you is that God has proven time and time again in His Word and in His work that at just the last minute when all hope seems lost, He loves to bring deliverance and victory. 
So hang on, the night is often darkest before the dawn. I can also give you this comfort from the Heidelberg Catechism. You are not your own, but belong body and soul in life and in death to your faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all your sins with His precious blood and has set you free from the tyranny of the devil. Listen to this. He also watches over you in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of your Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work. All things must work together for your salvation. Let me close with an explanation from one preacher about why stories about snatching victory from the jaws of defeat are so powerful. Do you know what the word gospel means? In Greek, the word is euangelion. It means literally the joy news. What did the angels say when Jesus is born? Behold, I bring glad tidings of great joy. That's the news of great joy. The word gospel means joy news. And J.R.R. Tolkien, in his great essay on fairy stories, says there's a kind of story, and he ought to know, that brings us unbelievable joy. Whether it's a movie or a story we're reading or a story we see depicted on a stage or a story we hear sung about. There are certain stories, he says, that bring us unbelievable joy. He says these stories always have a certain kernel to them. He says there's always some incredible hopeless situation and victory is snatched out of the jaws of defeat. But why or how? Always through someone who comes in and whose weakness turns out to be strength. Someone whose defeat turns out to be victory. He says it's those kinds of stories that just seem to bring us joy. He calls them eucatastrophes. Do you know what the word eucatastrophe means? It means the joyful catastrophe. The tragedy that turns out to be a triumph. The sacrifice that turns out... To bring joy, the weakness that ends up being strength, the defeat that ends up being victory. He said, however, there's a eucatastrophe of the eucatastrophes. There is a grand story in all the stories. He believes there's a bass string to the human heart, and those stories can kind of make a reverberate of a little bit, but can't pluck it. But he says there's only one story that can. The story of the gospel. All the other stories are based on the grand story. From the ugly duckling who turns out to be the swan to beauty and the beast. Tolkien says the gospel story is the only story that will pluck that string. So the whole heart never stops reverberating and vibrating with joy. The reason it will reverberate is... Of all the great stories, this is not one more myth pointing to the great reality. This is the great reality itself. It happened. It really happened. There really is a beauty who kisses the beast. There really is a hero. There really is a savior of the world. Jesus Christ. Do you know that savior this morning? Have you trusted in Him and the real story of hope that He gives? May we all come in our desperation and find salvation. Let's pray. Lord, we come this morning and we are all desperate to find a story that makes sense of who we are and the brokenness in the world and gives us hope and meaning and the only story that's real and makes sense is a story that snatches victory from the jaws of defeat in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we pray this morning that you would, by your Spirit, show us how real that story is. Make it true and real in our hearts and in our lives so that we might live out 
the calling that you've called us to by the gospel. In Christ's name, amen.